Welcome to the Commerce Tomorrow podcast. Your one stop to learn about the technology that's powering the future of commerce. Here are your hosts, Dirk and Kelly. Hi, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of the Commerce Tomorrow podcast. I'm here today with my co-host, Kelly. Hi, Kelly. Hello. And uh, today our special guest is James Brook, uh, founder and CEO of Ampliance. Uh Hi. Hi, Dirk. Hi, Kelly. Great to be here. Great to have you uh, with us uh, for, for yeah the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, I think it will be uh, pretty interesting. Uh, we will cover a lot of topics uh, on the origins of software as a service, uh, yep. experience management platforms, um, API orientation, um, and a lot. So a lot of topics we will dive in. But before we get too deep into that, um, can you give us a personal introduction and uh, talk about yeah your, your career and history with Ampliance so far? Sure, um, absolutely. So personal history-wise, I, I first got involved with this whole internet thing uh, back in 1994. I dropped out of university. I was doing a degree in computational physics. It was far too hard. And um, I started an internet business then. So that was really, you know, when the, the sort of first taste we had of building things in this new way. I think I built a couple of CMSs and an e-com platform and various other things back in the day. Sold that eventually um, to to another company and then ended up in London, actually, with some of the really big consultancies, the March 1st, APS. When, when was that, roughly? So that was sort of late 99, okay. or sort of early 99 when I came down to London. And then, you know, that whole um, Internet 1.0 boom had really taken off. And, uh, you know, we, we were engaged with, you know, countless companies in, in the UK to really help with everything from strategy all the way through to design and build and uh, and everything else. So it was a great time to, to be in the industry. And if, if you remember that far back, um, you know, there was a lot of software being bought. There was an awful lot of consulting being bought. I think uh, the phrase was that those that were selling the selling the spades were sort of making the, were making the money. Um, but uh, it was a great time actually to sort of learn the trade and, and really get involved with, with some of those early and interesting um, initiatives around not just e-commerce, but, uh, but marketing as well. Yeah, it was definitely a crazy time. Um, I, I remember it quite well, um, but there was also a lot. Yeah, it, it was first time for, for many of us uh, at, at that stage. And uh, when, when the market overheated and things run crazy, um, it was also um, a, 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 a very uh, good experience. <laughs> uh, well, you're absolutely right. I and mean, it's funny you say that. I was just looking at my notes um, from a minute ago. And I've, I've written down and underlined um, in Decker and, and Adobe Scene 7. And the reason for that was, if you remember, the post, you know, 2001 and all the terrible things that happened and, and, and the, the recession, you know, e-commerce was kind of dead. You know, there was this period, particularly in the UK, for about a year or two, where lots of early investments really hadn't paid off. The eyeballs that they'd expected weren't there. Um, customers were struggling, I think, to use e-commerce because you couldn't find anything. There was a massive problem with search. And there was also a massive problem with visualization of products. You couldn't actually, you, you might get to a PDP, but you couldn't work out what it was that you were going to buy because you couldn't see it. So, so you know, I remember at the time being at LBI, as it became, with John Williams, our CTO now at Ampliance, and um, we were sitting there trying to work out how do we go to market with an interesting value proposition and get some of these big retailers to start doing something interesting on the project side. And, and we really started to, to push this whole Indeca guided navigation piece. So we solved or automated that problem of finding something. And we also started integrating the likes of Scene 7 plus some con basic content tools into the e-commerce customer journey. And uh, that was sort of our first real inkling of, of you know, using the technology to completely change um, fundamentally the, the customer experience, which was pretty poor at the time, if you remember in e-commerce land. You know, you were, you were lucky if you got a, a decent search, and a, you know, and uh, by the time you got to a product page, some some product details that you could really recognize. So, so following the trough of the dot com crash, how did you uh, how did you come out of that, and how did you end up at Ampliance ultimately, or how did you found Ampliance? Yeah, so John and I had met at, at LBI. We did all this work around um, you know, trying to build value propositions to really get get retail e commerce sort of back off the ground. Um, obviously, the economy eventually recovered. I, I, I did end up in a company called um, Detica in the UK. And Detica uh, was completely different. It wasn't all new media and internet consulting. But what they had was this very 
large scale SaaS platform for retail banking fraud. It was a huge sort of data aggregation platform and it looked for um, interesting correlations between activity across retail banking, all that sort of thing. But it was the first opportunity I had to, to see how the SaaS model itself might work. And um, I think, you know, that, that really kind of got me excited about getting hands back on the levers. So left Etica after a year, having, having had lots of experience of running a model like that, which was quite new and different. And, um, you know, I ended up sort of back with um, a bunch of folks, one of whom is Rory Dennis, my co-founder of Ampliant, um, looking at different technologies to, to sort of change the way in which we could bring content into the e-commerce experience. And, and originally we had a company called 10 CMS. 10 being the perfect 10, so it was, it was called 10 CMS. We, we changed the name to Ampliance, Amplified Experience, because we got fed up with people asking us, why do we call the company 10 centimeters, which was irritating. So, <laughs> so, so a bit of a rebrand after that, as you can imagine. And uh, you know, th- then we really got back involved with, with some of the early e-commerce platforms like, uh, like Vendor and then subsequently Demandware uh, on the SaaS side. You know, back in the day, it was ATG and IBM and, and you know, early Hygris. And uh, really started thinking hard about how do we make content work in the context of e-commerce journey. So before we talk about how do you actually make it work, um, uh, let's uh, stick uh, for a moment um, at the company. Where, where are you today when, when it comes to um, the size of the company, um, customers that you are serving, types of customers, um, employees, uh, geographics? Um, yeah, just a little bit more here. Sure. So um, we are about 140 customers now. That's that's probably about 350 to 400 brands because a lot of those customers are, are big brand groups like Otto. You have um, you know plenty plenty of, of sub brands or or, brand, or or even just distinct brands within the group. Um, I think last year we delivered 1.5 trillion content objects off the platform, which uh, is a huge amount of content. It's about a million Amazing. visits a month. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of content coming off Amplitz, that's for sure. Yeah, it's about a billion visits a month. At peak, it was three hundred, three or 400,000 content objects per second. Um, there's about 120 of us globally. Um, UK is obviously headquarters. I'm sat here in the office in Covent Garden. Uh, we've got our development and support operations in the north of the UK, and uh, we've got uh, sales and marketing operations in Northern Europe and uh, North America. But our customers are everywhere, frankly. So we've got customer sites going live in China, Japan, the Philippines, Australia, you name it. Yeah. And, you know, you, you guys were kind of famous, or I guess are famous for being one of the very first SaaS vendors um, out on the market, right? And you had a lot of good experience in the the 90s and even 2000s with, uh, you know, with SaaS platforms. So what were some of the uh, lessons that you learned along the way in establishing a SaaS-based business? <laughs> I think mainly we got it wrong, Kenny, quite a lot. <laughs> you have to get it wrong first to get it right, I guess, right? <laughs> exactly. exactly. We, definitely, uh, we definitely struggled a little bit early on with the whole idea of a subscription model because it actually quite, quite substantially changes the dynamic between you and, you and the customer. All of a sudden, you've got this uh, relationship, which uh, is actually much, much, much more aligned in the sense of customer has the ability to exit that relationship after two or three years, potentially. So, so I think what was really hard work to begin with was trying to work out how do we innovate and still do customer you know service in a way which is going to be cost effective you know and continue to take customers that may be on an older version of the platform with us you know we had all of these sort of early challenges in terms of managing the innovation pipeline product release schedules all of that kind of stuff and in fact we've been through a whole product cycle on our initial product interactive merchandising which was a shopping media production tool um, which we, we ended life you know, two years ago. So, so we've, we've had to learn a whole range of different disciplines from customer success, um, sort of management of a sort of commercial um, recurring revenue type model, uh, all the way through to um, you know, getting that sort of release pipeline set up in the right way so that we can, we can really take customers on a journey with us um, that, that you know, doesn't, end at some point but that really just helps them to continue to to optimize and grow and, and deliver their digital experience so yeah like i say we, we we've not always got it right but uh, you know i think after a while if you get the right metrics and kpis in the business and you really start to, to measure the right things you tend to make much better decisions over time and, you know fingers crossed we're still here <laughs> oh you will you will uh, so 
how I remember it, um, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but um, you became known um, and, and successful first as a DUM, right? So digital asset management um, platform, um, distributing that um, at, at a global scale. And then you expanded to more content and, and moved uh, more into the full DXP space. Is it correct how I phrased it? And, and if so, maybe tell us about that journey and, and uh, how that happened. Yeah, so, so nearly, nearly correct. I think the initial product was actually a, a shoppable media production tool, this thing that we yep. interactive merchandising. And, and that was actually the number one thing that we started with. The problem with that was it was too narrow a use case. And around about that time, I think this was 2011-ish, um, Scene 7 got bought by Adobe. And Scene 7 was the rich media management tool set that lots of big retailers relied on to get uh, product media in particular into the product page and do that in a really automated way, particularly for Zooms and Spins and all of these other types of interactive content. And uh, we realized actually that given Adobe were going to suck at Scene 7 up and sort of start pushing them into their very giant sort of tier one relationships in the US, that would leave a big opportunity in the mid-market. So our first really sophisticated, very scalable cloud platform was, was, a, was a Scene 7 replacement, if you like. It was built you know, in AWS. It used all the sort of new capabilities of that in terms of auto-scaling and um, sort of low-balance CDNs. And, and then we built, as part of that, a very, a very rich sort of set of functionality at the back end that gave you a set of a retail DAM um, capabilities. It was built API first. It was sort of one of our first super scalable platforms. You know, we now have something like 400 million images and, and videos and bits of content in that platform. So it had to do a lot of scaling. Uh, we ingest I don't know, a couple of hundred thousand you know, bits of image and video content through that probably uh, every hour, uh, you know, over some, some parts of the week. So, so that was really the first um, thing that, that we got to work at a huge scale and that we could really take the market on in this completely new way. And um, like I say, I kind of think about it as image and video content management as opposed to just the dam because the reality is that we're driving that 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 rich media into lots of different contexts if you look at any um retail or e-commerce experience these days they tend to be extremely visual yeah, there's an awful lot of content which is really just images and videos and and, and therefore it's sort of a, a very large part of the content management problem is to, to get that part of it right so, um, so that was super successful, and um, we, we had huge success, particularly in migrating Adobe's big customers over to us. Um, so uh, that kind of, again, sort of dragged us up the really sort of complex experience curve and, and taught us a lot of things about how to deal with those, you know, really sophisticated enterprise customers that had, you know, 10 or 20 million pieces of media to migrate and a huge number of visits per month, maybe 150 million, that sort of scale. And... Um, and then we realized, of course, that, you know, there was a huge opportunity to take the same approach, essentially, that we took to that problem and apply it to content management in general. And that was really the big insight we had, which is this whole idea of kind of headlessness, this sort of, you know, hold the, the content as data and deliver a, a rendition of that content, a variant of that content on demand that's specific for that particular viewport. Um, that was a really powerful concept. And in fact, if we took that, that approach to... The CMS space, we thought we could do something really interesting. And, and of course, that's really how we sort of got our foot on the ladder with the whole experience piece. And now, of course, we're, we're not just looking at content and media repositories, we're looking at the, the entire experience and the management of uh, everything from, you know, the, the nav all the way through to the structure of the page, the layout, all of the other pieces that traditional web CMS would do. But uh, we're doing that in the new way as, as a sort of headless microservices uh, approach. And I think that's extremely powerful for modern for modern consumers, for consumer type experiences. You know, I guess before we get too far, can you clarify some terms? So there's CMS, right? There's web content management, digital experience platform. There's content as a service, there's headless. <laughs> can you just spend a minute and try to make a little sense of this uh, alphabet soup here? I'll do my best, Kelly. Um, so CMS, CMS is easy. We can do that one or content management system. So uh, when you hear that term CMS, it's, it's normally content management system. And DAM was one we used earlier, digital asset management. So what were the other ones? DXP, DXP, digital experience platform. 
I would say, for DXP and WCM is web content management, which I think is the term generally used these days for the legacy content management systems, the sort of on-premise, old-school, end-tier you know, solutions of the past. Uh, and then this term content as a service, which I think is actually the most um, most widely sort of misunderstood and the most used in, in lots of different contexts, this whole idea of content as a service. Some people think content as a service applies to sort of delivering creative services through a wrapper, you know, into um, to, to customers. Others see content as a service as a kind of API-led CMS that comes from the cloud. Uh, I think that the, the sort of meaning can be a bit interchangeable on that. So we've stopped using content as a service because it's a bit confusing. So uh, given that you're in uh, different um, uh, areas of the digital experience chain or value chain, um, who do you see as your main competitors? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, it, it varies a little bit by the type of customer engagement that we're involved with. But uh, realistically, it's, it's Adobe AEM because there's a lot of it still in customers. So they may have an e-commerce platform that could be, you know, one of one of the legacy folks uh, of all the the entity oracles that the SAP CXs and Hybrises and all that sort of stuff. But quite often there will also be a content management platform in the big in these really big opportunities that comes from Adobe that has um, that sort of web CMS web content management type flavor. Uh, quite often they've got CQ Dam in there, and quite often they've got. That they're into the scene seven, which media sort of management of every product. So, so we do a lot of of take out of that. Um, the other ones that we see in newer type opportunities, Bloomreach, quite often, I have to say, of the sort of legacy um, systems that we that we come up against, you know, that are, that are in that kind of web content management space. Um, and then we see a couple of the new guys quite often. So, Contentful appear on our radar every now and again. Um, typically, not in the really big sophisticated complex ops they tend to be in the in the smaller developer sort of driven projects that are more app focused um, and uh, occasionally we come across content stack as well although not as often i have to say uh, I, i know it's maybe an, uh, uh, um, a complex question because i know it depends by customer and who you're competing against or who you're replacing but in general how would you describe your your main usps um and and uh, Yeah, and, and, and also uh, competition advantages um, to, to the market um, on your product. Yeah. yeah, I think there are some generic ones which, which we really care about and we think they're absolutely the crown jewels of the, of the business. Um, and they tend to be around scale and performance. I think when you're um, dealing with you know, these sort of very large scale customer experiences that are dealing in you know, the high tens of millions to, to hundreds of millions of visits per month, You're talking about a huge amount of, um, of, of ridiculously high content delivery demand, particularly over little peak periods as well. And uh, you've got to be able to deliver against that in a way that uh, gives those customers total confidence that putting their trust in you and delivering those services off our infrastructure is going to be something that isn't going to let them down. So I think that for us has been one of the critical components of, of our data market and the way that we tell our story is to say, you know, we've built a platform that, you know, that delivers more scale you know, frankly, than, than most other e-commerce e platforms anywhere. And uh, we've got a, an enviable track record of, of doing that with, with very little service interruption at all. So if you run on a four, four nines monthly SLA, that's less than four minutes downtime a month. Everything's low balance, so most people don't even notice if something does fail in one area and, and we automatically switch across. Um, that gives them huge confidence that they can run more and more services out of the Amplex cloud. And, uh, you know, therefore, we, we sort of really focus on the performance piece. I think this is getting even more critical, frankly, when it comes to this whole new progressive web app infrastructure, you know, that's very much mobile first for, for the, for the, for the e-commerce um, brands themselves. They're trying to make sure that that experience is as uh, light and fast as it possibly can be. I, I would argue that some would, um, that sub one second page late time is absolutely you know, the, the new benchmark for good in, in that world. So you also need to be able to aggregate lots of content requests together that could be quite sophisticated queries and deliver them back into that app experience. You know, ideally, you know, sub 200 milliseconds in aggregate, which means actually the individual API queries need to be maybe 35 milliseconds. 
time to first bite or less. And that's really what we have focused on is this ability to build a very sophisticated, you know, content graph that can describe the digital experience, but, but deliver that at a, at a completely different order of magnitude, scale and performance than our competitors. Um, and speaking of competitors, um, we saw that the 2020 Magic Quadrant for DXPs just came out. And I know you aren't quite a DXP per se, but um, I saw that Gartner only covered the older suites. <laughs> That's and true, yeah. You and um, your competitors, right? Um, content Stack, Content Full. Like yeah. they, they left out all the pure play content vendors. Um, why did they do that? <laughs> yeah. And that I mean, I have to admit, it's a, it's a sort of strange, <laughs> strange mix, isn't it? You know, in the sense, it's all the older folk. I think uh, I, I, I genuinely believe that there is quite a different way to think about our worlds. You know, the one that that, that we're in and you're in, that uh, is this more modular uh, approach to building software that has this ability to um, you know to to sort of define a completely new paradigm, really, for for the architecture that's going to underpin these experiences. But it's still reasonably early, I, you know, I think we all agree, in terms of how the market's moving. There's massive upside in terms of what we're all doing. But um, there's still a lot of legacy stuff around. I think it's just a function of really, I think some of the, the customers that Gartner probably talks to on a daily basis, I think there's a lot more of this legacy stuff out there than, uh, you know, than, than, than we would like to think maybe. But um, as a result, I think most of the inquiries come around that stuff and, and there's still really interest in, in there their offerings so i suspect that's why uh, is it the right thing to do i don't think so at all i think that you know the, the, the reality of our world is that um this this change is coming and this change is coming really quickly and i think once the tipping point towards this new paradigm is reached and that's that's now or, or very soon uh, the whole market is going to start to to need to know exactly how do you build a, a digital experience platform out of all these new components and, and how do you do it in a way that Gives you the same breadth of functionality, but you know radically changes total cost of ownership, agility, performance, and all the all the things that we are collectively able to do. Um, so, you know, I think that the opportunity is there for some of these analysts to really kind of get stuck into the new wave, and, and I look forward to that conversation. Yeah, and you know, we we suffer from this problem as well. But you know, how do you convince the rest of the market that? Um, the best of breed solution is not as scary as it used to, because I remember in the you yeah. know in the mid two thousands, right? You used to have these best of breed. There was a big best of breed wave back then, and it was downright scary to integrate all of these mm. third parties together, right? And you had to use uh, old SOA and a big service bus, and you yeah, know, it, was, it was a lot of work, right? <laughs> it was a lot and of work. Yes. How do you? How do you go to market? It, you know, there are a lot of companies our size. We're smaller SaaS vendors. We're one, two, three, yeah. four hundred people. But you know, if you look at an Adobe, you know, Adobe has what twenty something thousand employees. SAP has over a hundred thousand. You know, how collectively do we as an industry uh, compete against these big legacy vendors? Yeah, I think the you know the, the reality is we're, we're you know I've read a very interesting post actually. I think it was it was Thomas from Redpoint. I think put it out the other, the other week, and he said, you know, typically to, to make a new category, you know, to sort of or, or change fundamentally the, the competitive dynamics of a category requires two hundred ish plus million dollars worth of, of spend. So you can either find one completely game changing vendor, or actually, you know, what tends to happen, particularly in these more mature complex categories like ours, um, is that actually all of our startups you know, folks that have sort of come and raised money and got into the market and started redefining the way the market um, refers to, to itself, um, collectively can get way over that 200 million, you know, sort of mark quite quickly. And in fact, the reality is we're all working on it together from slightly different angles, I think, at times. Um, to it, For it to really go, though, I think two things need to happen. One, we need some absolutely stellar case studies, and there's plenty of those that are really just beginning to appear at the kind of scale where everybody sits up and takes notice that this is completely different order, of, you know, in terms of value. Secondly, obviously, the, the analysts and other folk need to, to get in behind that. But I think the other part of the problem to solve, and this is one that we're, you know, we're working together on, is, is building the sort of reference architectures and solutions that customers can buy into that, that to some extent, simplify the decision-making process and kind of give them one or, you know, two to three options as opposed to 10. And I think that's really what's beginning to happen. The market's shaking out, 
you know, vendors are finding their niche where they can be most effective in terms of creating value. They're building alliances with each other and they're starting to talk to the market in a way the market can understand, uh, which is to say, you know, here's, a, here's, here's the reference architectures for these sorts of use cases. And I think, you know, that in combination, like I say, with some great case studies and continued good marketing around, around all these things, I think is really telling the time. My, my next question also goes a little bit into the direction, I think, um, or, or the challenge um, that, that sometimes might be with the analyst. Um, so when you sell to the business part of uh, your customer or the marketing um, team on that, how do you translate your, your non-functional um, benefits of your architecture? So multi-tenancy, the APIs, the cloud native, <laughs> um, the headless yeah. approach to someone who doesn't know what an API is or when you use the term JSON that they think there's actually a JSON missing in the room. <laughs> exactly. so how, how, do you, how do you address that and, and make it clear to the business side what the value is? Yeah, I think, you know, it's, as always, <laughs> these things, I, we, we've all tried to, in our careers, um, find, find friendlier ways in which to articulate technology advantages. I think in this particular instance for us, because we focus a lot more on the, on the, the output, as it were, and the use of those APIs in delivering the experience, it's all about talking about the customer experience and the effectiveness of that experience in driving the retailer's KPIs. So um, you know, a good example of that, obviously, is speed and performance. You know, there's this mobile conversion catastrophe out there Where you know everybody's um, everybody's visits are sort of moving to um, to mobile sessions, and those sessions convert at you know, 50% or less than the desktop. I mean, this is a disaster, by the way, for for some of these businesses because their economics or their their, their e-commerce model just just don't work when that happens. Um, but the the number one driver, I would argue, to you know for improving performance in that regard is is page load speed and the ability to to build this much slicker experience. So that uh, the consumer themselves interacts with, with far more of the content and actually gets to the end of that customer journey far more often. So talking about, you know, as you say, SLAs and APIs and it's sort of abstract, it's quite difficult to make meaningful, but I think the reality of it is if you turn it into, you know, improvements to, you know, reductions in bounce rate, improvements to conversion, overall massive impacts on the quality of experience of that storefront from a, you know, from a customer's perspective, Uh, I think that begins to resonate very nicely with uh, the folks in the room because they have spent a lot of money trying to solve things like performance. They're spending huge amounts of money trying to improve, you know, simple things like, um, you know, the findability of product uh, within the site, the, you know, the effectiveness of that navigation, um, the overall quality of site information and product. And uh, all of those things are really things that can be improved when you start taking this new approach. So, you know, I think it's, it's key not to talk about the inputs too much, except to your technical colleagues who obviously love all this stuff and uh, spend a lot of time focused on, on the real qualitative benefits that it brings in terms of speed, agility, flexibility, and fundamentally an experience that, that puts that customer in a competitive position. Uh, speaking about customers, um, we see that you have a strong focus on retail e-commerce and also some of the examples you just mentioned um, are uh, going into that direction. Um, why is that? I think we uh, content, content was a bigger challenge, I think, originally to, for some of the brands. If you think about um, to the things back in 2006, 7, 8, when... Consumer brands like Tom Ford and Mark Jacobs, who are on our books, and um, Mulberry and all these sort of beautiful manufacturers of fantastically high-end products that were quite expensive, started trying to get into e-commerce. Um, they had this, um, they had a ton of content and media being, being brands. They, they, they invested a ton of uh, their own money in building this sort of great, great sets of content, but they couldn't get that content into the e-commerce experience and really make that e-commerce experience simultaneously a, a brand experience and a storefront. So that was really the problem that we solved back in the early days. And uh, as a result, we, we built a lot of functionality and capability. It was all about optimizing that workflow, making that whole content production process work, um, delivering those kind of experiences at scale. So, you know, I think um, partly it's historical as a result. We, we, just, we just know what we're doing in that space. We understand those workflows. We know what... Uh, what's happening, particularly on, on the sort of manufacturing brand side. The other side of the coin for them, of course, is they all wholesale into giant retailers 
and those retailers are multi-category, multi-brand, so bigger, more complex, and we got dragged into those through the brand space and, and actually started to work you know, with some of the biggest in the industry. And you build a certain degree of focus and domain expertise and real knowledge and understanding of, of, of what makes a difference for those sorts of customers. And uh, other customers, you know, really appreciate that level of um, deep expertise in the, in the problems that they're trying to solve. And I think that the net net of that is that we've, we've remained very focused and our, it's very much our ambition to win in those core e-commerce verticals and not get dragged into too many adjacencies where we're going to be a little bit diluted in terms of the value we can bring. And, uh, you know, not as effective, I think, in terms of, you know, really delivering a, a great experience for our customers. So it's been partly historical, um, but there's also, you know, a lot of intent there to, to be the best that we can be, you know, in those core verticals and, and retail is obviously right at the top of the list. And why specifically do retailers have such a problem adopting newer technology? We see this all the time, right, that these old school retailers get stuck in their ways and, you know, they specifically don't adopt headless as quickly as other industries and yeah. other verticals do. Do you, do you have any thoughts on why that is? Yeah, I think um, I think there's a there's a whole product problem. Um, you know, you know, in terms of taking these people into the future, I've actually written about this quite a lot recently. I've, I've published a couple of media articles and just about a roll out a white paper to this effect as well, which which sort of talks about the challenges for particularly quite complex retailing moving to a completely so headless commerce type architecture. And I think the reality of the world is that, um, you know, even the stuff that, that we used to play with, you know, all that uh, BCC stuff in ATG and the business manager in Salesforce and all those other things, although they're not, let's face it, uh, the best uh, ex- you know, tools, experiences you've ever come across in your life, they are quite functional. And I think for particularly for big, complex retail teams that are doing a lot of promotions, a lot of content, a lot of quite sophisticated merchandising views, creating landing pages, you know, there's a lot of this sort of blocking and tackling day in, day out that they need to solve for. Um, they are, even though they, they will tell you they, they, they can't wait to leave the environments that they're in and they, they're really looking forward to this new world, I think until they can see some of those tools coming together in a way that um, completely replace and, and ideally significantly improve the things that they're used to working with in those commerce admins, um, then I think there's a real reticence for them to actually make that transition. And I think this is really where, you know, the, this is really where, you know, as industry folk, we, 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 we're getting ourselves together and starting to, to really build a more comprehensive whole product, if you like, or whole solution for, for retail. And I think there's a massive opportunity now to, to take retailers into this new world we're already working with 10 or 12 ourselves that have gone completely 100% headless. But what they've forced us to do, and it's, and it's the right thing to do, is to, is to build out you know, all of the missing pieces that uh, they perceive that they need to have if they get rid of those sort of old school legacy commerce admin tools. And, and you know, speaking of tooling and, and everything else, right? business users do need a, a, a head at some point. Right, they need yeah. to be able to see what they're building. They need to see those category pages. So, are you seeing um, these front end as a service platforms like Mobify and Fantastic really taking off? Um, what capabilities have you built in your product? Uh, and uh, you know, I've actually seen some of them, but I just wanted to ask you for the, uh, sure. for the audience because I think they're pretty cool. Um, how do you solve that the head problem with headless? <laughs> <laughs> you're right. I mean, you know, the great irony of this. I mean, unless unless like, you're doing something, you know, directly into into an IoT device, it's kind of hard not to have some heads. But I think the reality, of course, is that is that there are many heads, in, and uh, most people's customer experience these days is, is getting more and more complex. You've got lots of places where that experience needs to be delivered in an e-commerce transaction. Where it could be in store, it could be out in the field, it could be in an app, and it could very specifically be on you know PWA and an older website, an international site. You name it, you could have tens of these things quite quickly. Um, so I think there's a real challenge, obviously, in, in sort of managing multiple heads and obviously delivering and orchestrating an experience which is um, synchronized and sort of works from a brand perspective as well as from a, a sort of merchant's perspective as well. So I think there's, there's this huge evolving new stack. That new stack includes the likes of Mobify. Um, we're doing quite a lot with them. We're doing quite a lot with MoveWeb. 
particularly in the US, on very accelerated, you know, PWA type uh, type, type experiences. Um, I must admit, we've done nothing yet with Frontastic, although hopefully we'll, we'll be an opportunity with them soon. But I think there is a there is a real challenge around managing this new front end architecture. You know, the head has become quite often a progressive web app. That progressive web app is built uses you know, React or Vue or Angular or whatever it happens to be your particular favorite variant of the JavaScript uh, framework to build them in. But also you need to manage code deployment. You also need to manage um, you know, many of the sort of aspects of, of that experience in the head itself. You need to aggregate your APIs into something that's a bit more manageable using GraphQL or your BFF or whatever it happens to be. So, so there's a whole new front end sort of architecture that's very much focused on supporting the, the development of those experiences. There's lots of accelerators out there that will that'll help customers get there very quickly. So we are seeing a lot of that. Um, but what we noticed, and this is absolutely key in terms of our evolution, is that um, retailers and, and the tech teams themselves were starting to hard code the experience into those, those, those BWAs. And the reason for that is because you've lost some of the experience management tools, the templating of the, of the old web CMS and all those other functionalities that maybe got cut off with the head when you, when you go from you know, an old legacy platform into the new world. So what we've been doing at Amplit is really focusing in the last six or nine months on building out all of the capabilities that you need to manage you know, navigation, app routing, uh, SEO, you know, um, page templates, effectively screen templates, layouts, all the things that maybe got lost in the transition and put them back in control of business users and uh, therefore kind of give you head management tools but without fixing any of those things into any individual um, you know, way of, of displaying the content and the media and the product, and therefore kind of retaining all the flexibility and performance benefits in a new way, but uh, allowing the, the flexibility to go and build using you know, any of these new frameworks. Great. So we're getting to the end of this episode, but I have one last question. Um, what's next for Ampliance? Uh, well, any big things you plan for 2020 and beyond that you can... <laughs> share with the audience sure um yeah we're doing a lot of work with with other vendors in the industry really to, to try and bring things together we've we've just done a lot of uh integration with algolia so bringing such merchandising in, into the platform in a, in a slightly more um explicit sort of first class way um we can actually extend that integration pattern out into any search merch platform but um, we have a lot of demand from customers for more dynamic more personalized experiences. So we very much want to front up and deliver the capabilities uh, required to do that. Uh, and we've got these very nice, uh, very slick um, new functional components that are all about layout, all about being able to control the actual experience, the, the functional components as well as the content and really build that experience and manage it. And I think those things in combination are, are starting to close the gap for some of these more complex retail use cases and uh, you know really enable us to you know, to take on some of these these very large, very complex, but um, they're really interesting challenges with customers and just, you know, continue to accelerate the, the way the market's moving towards you know, microservices and headless. So that's that's probably enough, frankly, for the rest of Absolutely. the year. Absolutely. Absolutely. So lots of things to do. Um, wish you, um, yeah, all the success. Uh, uh, I, I know you will have it. Um, so... Um, That's a wrap. Uh, thanks for, for being with us on this podcast episode, um, James. And um, yeah, uh, look Good, thank forward you. to stay up to date. Yeah, absolutely. We'll look forward to seeing you both soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Have a thanks. great day. Cheerio.